Good morning, church. Uh, if you're here for the first time today or sometime in the future, you're checking us out and listening on, on YouTube, which apparently there are a number of friends and family of those in our church or people in the community who do listen to our YouTube channel, uh, welcome. My name is Sean and I serve on staff here at Heritage as our teaching pastor. Over the last number of weeks, we have been walking through the life of Abraham together in the book of Genesis. Abraham is someone that the Bible repeatedly points out over and over again in the Old Testament and the Gospels and the book of Acts and the letters of Paul. It points him out as someone who illustrates or models what it looks like to live as someone who has placed their entire trust in God. The book of Galatians, chapter 3, verse 9, calls Abraham the man of faith. The book of Romans, uh, chapter 4, verses 18 to 25, it says this about him. In hope, Abraham believed against hope that he should become the father of many nations. He did not weaken in faith when he considered his own body, which was as good as dead since he was about 100 years old, or when he considered the barrenness of Sarah's womb. No unbelief made him waver concerning the promises of God, but he grew strong in his faith as he gave glory to God. He was fully convinced that God was able to do what he had promised, and this is why his faith was counted to him as righteousness. The passage goes on to say, But the words it was counted to him were not written for his sake alone, but for ours also. It will be counted to us who place our trust in him, who raised from the dead Jesus our Lord, who was delivered up in our place because of our wickedness and raised so that we might be in right relationship with God. Finally, the book of Hebrews, uh, chapter 11, verses 8 to 16, it says, By faith Abraham obeyed when he was called to go out to a place that he was to receive as an inheritance. And he went out not knowing where he was going. By faith he went to live in the land of promise, as in a foreign land. For he was looking forward to the city that has foundations, whose designer and builder is God. And then it says about Abraham and other examples of, of faith in the Old Testament, it says, um, these all died in faith, not having received the things promised, but having seen them and greeted them from afar, and having acknowledged that they were strangers and exiles on the earth. They desired a better country, that is, a heavenly one. Therefore, God is not ashamed to be called their God, for he has prepared for them a city. And that, that last quote is important for us this morning, because it says that Abraham went to live in the land of promise as in a foreign land. What does it mean to live in a land where you might trust in God, but you live among many people who don't? How can we live as people who trust in God when uh, that way of life seems different or strange or maybe even dangerous to those around us? And how do we acknowledge that our actions may even have contributed to that negative feeling even while we insist that despite our missteps, the gospel is still the hope of the world? So first pray with me and then pray for me as I preach this sermon and then let's dig into God's word and, uh, and let's find out what it might have to say to us. Father God, thank you for the privilege that it is to open up your word. Thank you that uh, you reveal yourself through it. God, thank you that you give us, yes, good principles for how to live our lives and, uh, and, and good wisdom that we can apply, uh, but thank you that primarily you direct us towards you. God, you show us that we are not enough for ourselves, but that that's okay because you are enough in our place. You are enough for us. Help us to, to live in light of the gospel. Help us to be a gospel-centered people that never move on from that as, as, a, as a message that we first heard when we came to know Jesus, but as a message that we need to continue hearing, as a message that we can build our lives upon, as a message that makes everything different because you have done what we can't do. And you have called us to know and belong to you. And you have welcomed us in. And that is a gift that no one can take away. So help us to live in light of that reality this morning. I pray in Jesus' name. And all God's people said, Amen. Amen. All right. Do you get the sense that being a Christian is a weird or a strange or an offensive thing to those around you? Do you get the sense that some things have changed in our culture in the last little while? Things aren't the way that they used to be. Well, if you have felt that way, then you're right, and the reality is probably more significant than you have even realized. So how did we get here? 
This introduction will probably take a little bit longer than normal, but it's important as we get into the text. So uh, buckle up and get ready for a bit of a ride. Only three to four percent of Ontarians are a Bible are Bible believing evangelical Christians, according to the 2021 Canadian Census, which is already a few years old now. Those numbers are, of course, a little bit rough, so the real number could be somewhat higher, or possibly it could even be lower, depending on how things are counted. But how did we get here? How, in a land filled with Christian symbols and Christian buildings and Christian culture and Christian organizations and Christian institutions, did we come to find ourselves as outsiders in a strange land? Uh, Let me suggest four dates. These aren't definitive, but they might be helpful as we explore this question. The first date is 1974. Leslie Newbigin was just 27 years old and newly married to his wife Helen when in September of 1936 they set out to India to work on the missions field. Eleven years later, at the age of 38, Leslie became bishop of the fledgling Church of South India, which was an ecumenical group group formed from several different Protestant churches. He writes about that time, When I was a young missionary, I used to spend one evening each week in the monastery of the Ramakrishna Mission in the town where I lived, sitting on the floor with the monks and studying with them the Upanishads and the Gospels. In the great hall of the monastery, as in all the premises of the Ramakrishna Mission, there is a gallery of portraits of the great religious teachers of humankind. Among them, of course, is a portrait of Jesus. Each year on Christmas Day, worship was offered before this picture. Jesus was honored and worshiped as one of many manifestations of deity in the course of human history. To me, as a foreign missionary, it was obvious this was not a step towards the conversion of India. It was the co-option of Jesus into a Hindu worldview. Jesus had become just one figure in the endless cycle of karma and samsara, the wheel of being in which we are all caught up. He had been domesticated into the Hindu worldview. That view remained unchallenged. When Leslie Newbegin retired from his missionary work and returned to Britain at the age of 65 in 1974, he noticed something odd, and so he wrote about it in a famous book which he had published, which is called The Gospel in a Pluralist Society. He wrote, It was only slowly, through many experiences, that I began to see something of the domestication that had taken place in my own country, my own Christianity. I, too, had been guilty of domesticating the gospel. Britain was still nominally, or or on the surface, a Christian country, where preaching the gospel was calling people back to their spiritual roots. There was little distinction between evangelism and revival. But today, he says, The situation is different. What then is the meaning of evangelism in this kind of society? It cannot be the the sort of recall to religion, uh, which has often been the way evangelism was understood. They do not need recalling to religion. My purpose, he says, is to examine the roots of this culture which we share and to suggest how, as Christians, we can more confidently affirm our faith in this kind of intellectual climate. Thankfully, there was a wave of evangelism and awakening to the gospel at various points throughout the 1970s and the 80s and the 90s. Maybe some of you might have experienced uh, some of that. And it helped to address the concern and to reverse some of this trend that Leslie Newbigin was talking about. But eventually that zeal gave way to complacency. In 2004, when I became a Christian, the percentage of Canadians who were evangelicals uh, was at a multi-decade high of 19% of Canadians. Three years later, Uh, As the challenge of social media began to rise unmet by an increasingly inward-looking church, the percentage of evangelicals in Canada had gone down to 12%. Uh, Today, it is much lower. The second date that I'll give you is 2016. That is the year that David Kinnaman and Gabe Leons uh, published the book Good Faith, Being a Christian in When Society Thinks That You Are Irrelevant and Extreme. As part of the the research for that book, the Barna Group, which is a well-respected Christian polling and research firm of which Kinnaman is currently the president, interviewed thousands of adults as a representative sample in order to get an accurate lay of the cultural landscape. What it found was two perceptions of Christians were gaining cultural ground, that we are irrelevant and that we are extreme. 
Irrelevance is the feeling that Christianity doesn't make much difference to life. Kinnaman and Lanz wrote that 75% of U.S. adults agree a person can live a pretty good and decent life without being a Christian. And this keeps them feeling like Christianity is like a board game that isn't really worth learning. Um, they also write that part of the problem is that too many in the Christian community have bought into unbiblical notions about what it means to live the good life. And so it doesn't look to outsiders like we're doing anything really special. The charge of extremism extends to many things that most Christians would consider normal. So, for example, according to the research done by the Barna Group, 60% of adults overall, including 10% of evangelicals, believe that it is extreme to attempt to convert others to their faith. 52% claim it's extreme to believe that sexual relationships between people of the same sex are wrong. 51% of adults say it's extreme to protest a government policy that conflicts with one's religion. 42% say it's extreme to quit a good paying job to pursue missions work in another country. For over 24% of adults, as of 2016 when this research uh, was published, deciding to wait until marriage to have sex is a sign of religious extremism. Even reading the Bible silently in a public place, according to 11% of adults, in 2016 was considered to be extreme. The third date that I'll give you is 2021, only three years ago. That was the year that the most recent Canadian census was held. According to that census, the largest faith group in the province of Ontario today by a good margin, let's see if I can get this working, the largest group by a good margin are those who claim no religious affiliation whatsoever at 31.6% of all Ontarians. Second, 26% claim claim some sort of affiliation with the Catholic Church. Third, at uh, at 13.4% are Protestant Christians, followed by 7% who are Muslim and just over 4% who are Hindu. But even those numbers don't fully capture the spiritual reality of faith in our province. How many evangelical, Bible-believing Christians are there in Ontario? Well, the answer is, not many of us. Of the 13.4% Ontarians who would call themselves Protestants, that is not Catholic or Orthodox or Mormon or Jehovah's Witnesses, 4.1% of Protestants in in Ontario, sorry, 4.1% of people in Ontario, the largest group, uh, belong to the United Church of Canada. While that tradition may have at one time been a faithful one, that is unfortunately not the case today. A publicly reported survey of religious clergy within the United Church recently found that a significant percentage of United Church ministers do not even believe in God. When one famous atheist minister within the United Church in Ontario, uh, Greta Vosper from Toronto, had her credentials questioned, the denomination found that it had no grounds to remove them based on their doctrinal standards. You could be an outspoken atheist and be a minister within the United Church, and they could not remove your credentials because that did not significantly disagree with their principles. Another 3.7% of Ontarians belong to the Anglican Church, which recently voted at its general synod to bless same-sex marriages. Although the Anglican Church of Canada has widely blessed these marriages for years now, In 2019, over two-thirds of lay members and clergy of the United Church of Canada voted at its General Assembly to approve of same-sex marriages, although just slightly less than that number of bishops did so. Pete Blundell, who I invited to speak at our church last month, served for his entire career within the Anglican Communion, uh, but doesn't anymore, and I'll just let you fill in the blanks in there. I don't want to get him in too much trouble. Um, But he no longer serves within that communion, and, and there are reasons for that. Um, he's a wonderful Christian man, and he's a, he's a good friend, and he's a good mentor. And Pete, if you are listening to this, I am grateful for your friendship. And thank you for coming and speaking to us Baptists the last month. Uh, but getting back on track here, by far the largest chunk of Protestants in Ontario come from those two traditions. Filling out the rest of the list of Protestants in Ontario, only 1.2% of people are Baptists. Uh, 0.3% are Reformed, and 1.2% are Pentecostal. 
with another 3% belonging to other Protestant denominations. Although even amongst all of these, even among Baptist denominations, these are not all Bible-believing either, evangelicals across the board. Um, So I feel comfortable saying, based on these numbers, that Bible-believing evangelicals only really make up 3 to 5% of people in Ontario. Now, if you're here or you're listening, the point of this is not to take that number and judge the world around us as not belonging to our special group. That's not where we're going here this morning, so please don't hear that. The point is to recognize here this morning that people like us are a very, very, very small part of the religious landscape of our province. Tiny. And many people here remember a time not too long ago when they felt like they were the majority, That isn't the case today. The fourth and final date that I'll give you in the longest introduction to a sermon that I have ever preached is 2024. That is when Aaron Wren published the book Life in the Negative World, Confronting Challenges in an Anti-Christian Culture. So if you're keeping track of the discussion so far, we have gone from the gospel in a pluralist society in 1974 to Christianity is extreme and irrelevant in 2016, to the Canadian census in 2021, to offhandedly talking about not just a non-Christian culture, but an anti-Christian culture in 2024. Aaron writes uh, that the American church attendance, he writes that American church attendance reached a high watermark during the 1950s when around half of adults attended services on Sunday mornings. In that era, going to church was just another part of being an upstanding member of society. Starting sometime in the 1960s, that system began to break down. As part of a a fascinating look at the culture surrounding religion in North America over the last 60 years, Wren has suggested that from 1964 to 1994, society at large had a positive view of Christianity. That's 1964 to 1994. Had a positive view of Christianity. From 1994 to 2014, Society had a mostly neutral view of Christianity. And that from 2014 to today, society has shifted to having an overall negative view of Christianity, where, quote, being known as a Christian is a social negative, particularly in the higher status domains of society. Christian morality is expressly repudiated and now seen as a threat to the public good and new public moral order, holding to Christian moral views, publicly affirming the teachings of the Bible, or violating the new secular moral order can lead to negative consequences. Now, the point of all of this is not to sensationalize what we just described. It is not to see the world around us as an enemy. It is not to be fearful, or to be proud, or to be judgmental, or to be reactionary. It's not to see ourselves as better than others, or to make you shake your head at society, although that might reflect how some of you inwardly feel or might be responding to all of this. But based on the life of Abraham in Genesis 21 and 23, I want to suggest a better way to move forward as those who find ourselves living as wanderers in a strange land. The first thing that we should do is come to know the people of the land. Who are the people around us? What do they think about life? What do they believe? What are they like? Uh, We should follow Abraham's example here. We should share life with those around us. Invite people from your neighborhood or your apartment building or your workplace. Those who don't believe the same thing as you, invite them over for dinner or a game of pickleball or meet up for wing night. Abraham was not hiding away from them or constantly shunning or negatively reacting to the people of the land that he dwelt in. Uh, Look with me at Genesis 21, 27. It says, So Abraham took sheep and oxen, and gave them to Abimelech, and the two men made a covenant. Now, a covenant is an agreement between two people to be in a relationship. God has a covenant with us, even. Go down further to Genesis 21, verse 31. It says, both of them swore an oath. And then it says in verse 34, and Abraham sojourned, that means he dwelt, many days, in the land of the Philistines. See, Abraham formed relationships and made agreements and moved into the neighborhood and he gave gifts. And not just to the Philistines, but uh, go over to Genesis 23, verses 3 to 7. And it, it says this. 
It shows how he has a good relationship with another group of people in the land called the Hittites. Starting at verse 3, it says, Abraham rose up from before his dead and said to the Hittites, I am a sojourner and a foreigner among you. Give me property among you for a burying place, that I may bury my dead out of my sight. And the Hittites answered Abraham, Hear us, my lord, you are a prince of God among us. See, there's a good relationship there. They say, bury your dead in the choicest of our tombs. None of us will withhold from you his tomb to hinder you from burying your dead. Abraham rose and he bowed to the Hittites, the people of the land. See, he recognized them as the people of the land that he was living in. And even though they didn't hold the same values as him, he showed them his respect. And he clearly had a good relationship with them, although he was also clear about his own values as a follower of God. So he got to know the people of the land. What would it mean for us to get to know the people of the land, the community, the neighborhood that we're part of? Second, we can uh, come to know the people, and, we, and then we can, we can secure a place among them. This means that we don't just depend on those around us, but we begin to build up some influence by securing our own means of taking care of ourselves. This gives us the ability to stand our, stand our own ground when needed, but it also gives us the ability to be a blessing to others. For example, this building and this field that we have behind, uh, the, behind the church, they are, they're ours. So we don't need to go through the process of finding permits to hold an event on our property. We just do it. And we don't ask another group for permission to meet in this building for church, which I remember doing uh, while leading a church plant in Saskatchewan and, and getting kicked out of our place at a public school for summer while the floors were being redone and having to find a temporary location in an office in the meantime, which was a huge challenge. Uh, that was last summer. In Genesis 21, Abraham is working to secure the rights to own a well for himself so he can independently sustain himself in the land. In Genesis 23 with the Hittites, he is negotiating to buy land for himself where he can bury his own family members. And when they try to hold him off, he actually does push to secure a place for himself because that is a battle worth fighting for. That place is described in Genesis 23 and it is called the Cave of Magpalah and it is actually an important site even still today. Uh, there is a building around it dating to the time of Jesus and it's been built around that cave, and it holds the burial tomb of the Old Testament patriarchs Abraham and Isaac and Jacob. Um, if you went to Israel, you could actually visit it. Um, so going really quickly here, we can come to know people, we can secure a place among them, and then third, we can enter into agreements together with them. There is a, a huge rely. Re there's a huge variety of religious outlooks and worldviews in this province, but we can join hands to make a difference in our community and our province. The Ancaster Community Services organization that we bring non-perishables to in order to care for our community is not explicitly a Christian organization. If we needed to campaign for a policy that would impact us in our community, um, we would join our efforts with those outside of the evangelical group. We would have to because we're so small. If people in our church were to start businesses and develop a product and start to think about distribution, they would probably have to be on friendly terms with people of no religion and Catholics and Muslims and Sikhs and Hindus that might hold expertise in those areas. And as we enter into agreements with each other and work together, that might lead to opportunities to share the hope that we have with them. Fourth, we should also be willing to consider the lines of, of influence. This is important. There are some ways where it's okay to say, you know, in this area, we, we really teach our own kids. Kendra and I became homeschoolers partly for that reason, although we have good, solid Christian friends who aren't. It's okay to have certain areas where we say, no, we handle that. Uh, we, we take care of that within our own community. That's one of the biggest differences between Abraham and his nephew Lot. Both of them had relationships with people of the land. Both of them formed partnerships with those outside of the community. Both Abraham and Lot sought to be an influence on those around them. But Abraham succeeded and had better relationships with the people of the land than his nephew Lot did because he was careful on certain things to be self-sustaining and to handle certain things um, in-house. Lot didn't really do that. He let the values of Sodom get into him and his marriage and into his kids. And he didn't secure a means to look after himself. In fact, he got rid of his herds and his flocks that he had uh, when he was with Abraham all the way back in chapter 13. 
And by Genesis 19, uh, he had moved into the city and abandoned his flocks and herds and married his daughters to the men of Sodom. And so he really put himself at a disadvantage, and so they did not respect him. Which is why in Genesis 19, when all the men were gathering around his house and looking for his visitors, when he tried to settle them, settle them down, they said, this man is judging us. Abraham never got that reaction. He could look after himself for the most part. And so when he did enter into and, and partner in relationships with people of the land, he could do it as more or less an equal partner. He could be a blessing and he could stand his ground and he could form good relationships where he could say, this is, this is where I stand and this is where you stand. Let's, let's form an agreement. And he had great relationships with people because he considered the lines of influence. So just to review really quick, because we're going really fast. Uh, one, we can come to know the people of the land. Two, we can secure a place among them. Three, we can enter into agreements together. Four, we can work on lines of influence. And then fifth and finally, we can learn to speak the idiom. Um, That means we learn enough about those around us that we can talk to them. We can say things in words and pictures that they can relate to. Um, Look at the negotiations between Abraham and the Hittites in Genesis 23. Um... There's a kind of specific language that they're using when they're negotiating. Um, You can sort of pick up on it in English translation. Just all the examples of, hear us. And then Abraham, you know, catches on to that and starts saying, uh, hear hear me. And then there's this specific way of of looking at at a, at a, a negotiation together when something is reached. You know, Abraham talks in the hearing of the Hittites. This is much more explicit in the original language. Uh, he talks, he says, hear me, this is formal language, hear me again, in the hearing of the people of the land. Um, Ephron says to him, my Lord, listen to me, that, that's the same as hear me. And Abraham heard Ephron, and then they reached an agreement in the hearing of the Hittites. Abraham doesn't normally speak this way, he doesn't, he doesn't talk this way. And so uh, the Bible commentator Gordon Wenham has, uh, has, has this to say, He says, listen to me, in verse 8, seems to be Abraham's attempt to reproduce the Hittites' unusual phrase, do listen to us, verse 6. In verse 13, Abraham uses it again, but still not quite in the form they use. Rabin sees this as Abraham trying to speak the local idiom. The Hebrew of verse 13 seems to be a somewhat confused sentence, uh, but if you dot 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 do listen to me, apparently combining his usual opening formula with the Hittite formula. Here's the point of all that. Abraham knew the people of the land well enough and respected them enough to try to speak their language, to use their terms, to understand how they would put things, and to communicate with them in ways that they could understand. As we adjust to the reality around us, living in the rapidly changing landscape of of southern Ontario, in a place like Ancaster where the population is just rapidly increasing to now uh, 40,000 people, and the culture of the place is changing with it, we should learn how to speak to people around us who don't have the same background or beliefs as us. Why should we do that, though? Why should we go through the work to try to talk to those around us on their terms? We should do it because... That's why God has put us here for. That's why God has put us here. It is the entire reason. Let me, let me show you and, and pay attention to this. 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 9 says, The Lord is not slow to fulfill his promise, but he is patient towards you. He is not slow to fulfill his promise, but he is patient towards you, not wishing that any should perish, but that all should reach repentance but the day of the Lord will come. What does it mean? What does that mean? It means that the entire reason why history is still moving forward, why Jesus has not yet returned, is because there are still people that he knows have yet to come to know him. The entire reason why there was a yesterday and why you woke up in the same bed this morning that you went to sleep in last night and why you will likely get up in that same bed tomorrow is for the sake of the faith of those who have not yet put their trust in Jesus. Look at your non-Christian next-door neighbor the next time you're changing your oil in your driveway. He is the reason that Jesus is still waiting to return. Look at your neighbor the next time that you see him, because according to 2 Peter 3, verse 9, the complete, 
entire absolute reason that Jesus is still waiting to come back is because he loves that neighbor of yours. And who has he put around that neighbor to be a witness of God's amazing love for him? For all you know, it might be you. Imagine if the conclusion to all of human history might just be waiting on you. The angels have their trumpets ready. Everything is ready to go. The decorations are set. The heavenly banquet table is ready to be lowered down. And all of it is waiting. And all the angels are looking down from the cloud, just peering over. And all of it is waiting for you to finally get up the nerve to go over to the fence and talk to your neighbor and ask how life's been treating him or her and to share about the hope that Jesus gives that has gotten you through something similar. All of human history, just waiting for that one final person that God knows belongs to him. No pressure. So let me try to do my part to speak to anyone who might listen, to share the the hope that I have. I grew up not knowing Jesus. Um, and I thought I was doing pretty good on my own. I felt like if it came down to just doing nice things and watching out for other people, we all learned that in school. Share, play nice with others, uh, respect one another. I felt like I got that down. Or if I didn't have that down with someone, it's probably because they deserved it. Just being honest. And, um, and I thought that Christianity didn't really have anything to offer me I thought that Jesus was just some guy who taught some things and did miracles and is dead somewhere in the Middle East. And um, I didn't think I needed him. I I thought I was pretty good on my own. I I, I knew the idea that, like, okay, if there's no God, then we we die and, and that's it. And I kind of, I had made peace with that. Like, I was fine, you know, we'll find something to, to enjoy during, during this life. You know, everything has a season, including life. I really did feel that way. I didn't think I needed God. And, uh, but I began to be bothered because I thought there must be, there must be something behind all of this. Like there, there must be some kind of design, some kind of purpose. And I, I began to think about it. I, I, I started to, to think about, I, I was going through a, a couple of science cl- courses in, in high school at the time. And I remember thinking about the Big Bang and um, you know, everything coming from that. And I thought, well, but what, 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 what caused that? Like, what came before that? And then when, if I came up with something that came before that, I thought, well, what came before that? And what came before that? And what came before that? And what came before that? There, eventually, there just had to be something that, despite logic, had to have had no beginning. Because you couldn't go back forever. Something had to have always been there. And then I thought, okay, well, if something has always been there, uh, then it caused everything else. And so... It moved on its own, so it, it, it's eternal and it has a will. And then I thought, well, if it, if it pushed everything else into existence, then, then this, this thing is also very, very powerful. And then I thought, well, everything around us seems to just work on, on mathematical principles. There, there seems to be a, a kind of a connection between everything. Uh, it, it seems to have its own kind of design. There are so many things that need to work together in order for there to be life on planet Earth. By this point in my searching, I was talking with a couple of, uh, of, of youth counselors over at uh, uh, Joe Spice Youth Center. So I was already talking to some Christians. I didn't piece that together entirely on my own. Um, just want to give credit where it's due. So I thought, if there's something out there, if there's something that caused everything to exist, if my existence owes, owes itself to someone, someone else, if I can't truly explain everything apart from someone who got it all rolling, I want to find out who that is. And then I thought, wouldn't it be a shame if this really was all there was to life? If I just, if I ignored everything that might be offered to me by this, whatever this is, and, and, I, and I missed the relationship that, that that might want to have with me. And so I, I started to, to just think about other religions and the proof for that and look into why it is I'm a Christian. We talked about actually some of this in our Bible study this morning. So if you weren't there for that, come to the one next week. It'll be great. Um, And so I had these intellectual questions that were not leaving me 
content in my atheism or my agnosticism. And I had these burning kind of emotional things that made me go, this really can't be it, is it? And I realized one day when I was just randomly praying a prayer with someone who wanted to pray with me that didn't ask me first what I wanted to pray about, <laughs> um, I realized that, that, that whatever that was, that was God. And that God loves me. And that God sent his son, Jesus, to die on the cross for me, which means all of the brokenness, all of the messed up stuff in my heart, all of the pain that I caused myself and others around me, all the things that I tried to escape from or deny or say weren't really real, but I knew they were, all of that Jesus took away and he put that on the cross and he put that to death and so I don't have to carry that around anymore and that's God in human flesh doing that for me? Why? Because I have something to offer him. I have nothing to offer him. I have nothing that I can give him. I have nothing that he needs from me. He has done all of this entirely because he is good and he wants a relationship with me and that must mean that whatever this is, this being, this all-powerful, this eternal thing, this God, it must also mean that he's good. And it must also mean that he loves me. And it must also mean that he's figured out the solution to everything that makes me just ashamed of myself. That makes me hurt myself and those around me. That hurts my relationships. Makes me do things that I don't want to do, at least the day after. That God had taken all of that away from me. And if you're here and you're searching or you're listening online and you're searching and you don't know if this means anything to you, or if this could change your life, if this could turn it around, if it's really worth the examination, it is. Coming this November, I'll have been following Jesus for 20 years. I can tell you it makes a difference. He has made a difference in my life. And so with all the intellectual questions, with all the personal searching, with all the personal wrestling, this Jesus, he addresses everything that you're looking for, everything that you're hoping, everything that you're hiding away from. He resolves it. It all leads to him. Amen? Okay. So this is what it means to live in a strange land, not to give up hope and not to be astonished that there are others many, many others around who don't believe exactly what we believe or think the way that we think, that's normal for most of human history, for most parts of the world. No, it's an opportunity. It, it's an amazing privilege that we have to go out and to share the hope that we have with others, not on the basis of, I'm better than you and you need something that I have, because that's not true, but on the basis of, I've discovered hope. I've discovered a real foundation for hope. Would you join me? And we get to share that with those around us. And uh, how amazing it is that so many of us maybe have, have dreamt of going out onto the mission field. You're here. You are on the mission field. It's right here. You're part of it. Let me pray.